Hi everyone and welcome to the Safe COVID Cleaning for Collections. Museums and Galleries of New South Wales acknowledges the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and all the other traditional custodians of the lands on which we live and work. We pay respect to them as First Nations people with continuing connection to land, place, waters and community. Before we begin today, I'd like to bring your attention to the chat and Q&A sections on the bottom of your screens. So down the bottom, you have a chat function. At any time during the webinar today, if you have technical difficulties, please let us know via the chat and we will endeavor to help you out. You can also ask questions at any time during the webinar. Um, they won't be answered during the talks. We'll answer them at the end, we'll collate them. We'll try and get to as many as we can today, um, but we will also be answering uh, questions following this webinar. Um, so if there are more than we can answer today, we will get to those eventually. Please use the question and answer down the bottom of your screen um, so you can see that there. So um, I'd like to thank our partners and presenters today, uh, Julian Vickerstep, CEO of ICS, and Sarah Jane Rennie, Head of Collections Care at Sydney Living Museums. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Julian. Thank you very much, Dale. And hi, folks. Delighted to be with you today for this Safe COVID Cleaning for Collections uh, webinar. How this has come about is that ICS was approached by a collecting institution to um, provide uh, some guidance on how they might respond to a deep clean. And my, my colleague, Fiona Tennant, put together a manual for them. This um, collation of information we thought uh, would be more useful to share more widely. And so that's what we're doing today. This is a slightly organic process, so forgive us, there may be some, some bumps along the way. But the key thing is that we just want to make a pile of information which is publicly available, uh, uh, ready for uh, wider distribution and to make it much more easily accessible than for you to go hunting. The sources where the hunting is at, uh, we provide at various stages through the day. Our purpose really today, therefore, is to get this out. And there may be some repetition, both of what you know already and indeed what Sarah Jane and I do. But we thought this collation of information between uh, the deep clean and the safe uh, daily cleaning uh, would, would be most useful to bring together in this way. <clears throat> Now, the format of today uh, is as follows. First of all, I'm going to talk about the virus and transmission uh, of it. Then we're going to talk about how the virus can be killed. Then Sarah Jane is going to take over and talk about daily cleaning in the world of safe COVID, uh, and in particular to tell you the Sydney Living Museum story around how they have responded. Then I'm going to come back and talk about uh, a deep clean. And then finally, we're going to move to Q&A. We've got an hour set aside. Let's see how that goes and uh, how we deal with it as we go. And as I said, uh, bear with us with the organic nature of this. So first up on your screen, you have in glorious Technicolor the coronavirus, technically COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. It's so called because it has a corona or crown around it. This look is caused by the protein spikes that are embedded in its surface. And if we look at that in a little bit more detail, uh, most viruses consist of three building blocks, the genetic material surrounded by uh, the lipid membrane, and then finally the protein spikes. COVID-19 is no exception. The spikes are responsible for infecting the host, and these are anchored into the membrane, which is the shell for the virus. The membrane is the virus's weakest point, as we shall see. The irony is that you can't, for any price, get a drug to protect you against this virus, but a basic bar of soap kills it. So 
moving forward, let's look at a couple of issues, how COVID is transmitted. And it is basically transmitted in two forms, by aerosol and by surface transmission. In terms of aerosol, it's spread from person to person through small droplets expelled when an infected person sneezes, coughs, or speaks. When you cough, or especially when you sneeze, tiny droplets from your airways can fly up to 10 meters. The largest ones are thought to be the main coronavirus carriers, and they can go at least two meters. These can be breathed in by people close by, and thus the infection is transmitted. Of more import to us today is surface transmission. People can potentially become infected with coronavirus by touching contaminated surfaces or objects and then touching their eyes, nose or mouth. If an infected person coughs or exhales in the direction of an object in a museum or starts handling objects with contaminated hands, the object can be contaminated with the virus which then in theory can be transmitted to those who handle the object afterwards. These tiny droplets that are expelled end up on surfaces and they dry out quickly, but the viruses remain active. Human skin, for example, is an ideal surface for a virus. It's organic and the proteins and fatty acids and the dead cells on it interact and lock in with the virus. However, when you touch, say, a steel surface with a virus particle on it, it will stick to your skin and hence gets transferred onto your hands. And if you then touch your face, uh, you get infected. And it turns out that most people touch their face once every two to five minutes. Since collection objects tend to be handled infrequently and the virus deactivates naturally outside the human body, the trans chance of transmission is probably low. The risk may be higher where people work in heritage interiors and use heritage furnishings or where books or records or study collections are handled frequently by multiple users, potentially in quick succession. So let's look next at the whole issue of transmission persistence. So uh, we know that the virus will sit on surfaces and will uh, start dying once it's there, but for how long is it going to be around? And this depends very much on whether it's a hard or a soft surface. The virus has a finite amount of time it can reinfect once it's outside the human body. Without disruption by disinfectants, the lipid membrane degrades by chemical processes tied to drying out and exposure to air. The virus, therefore, as I said, is deactivating as soon as it's outside the human body, and given enough time, the infection risk from a contaminated surface disappears. Transmission is more likely soon after contamination, which is more likely to occur on surfaces that are frequently touched. The persistence of its life, of its liveliness, does vary with the characteristics of the surface material. For example, as I've already said, human skin is an ideal surface for a virus. It's organic, and the proteins and fatty acids interact with the virus and extend, significant, extend its persistence. Smooth surfaces like metal and hard plastics exhibit greater viral persistence and permit more transfer than porous surfaces like paper and textiles. In the context of heritage collections, which comprise a diversity of materials and structures, a simple conservative estimate that reflects the outer bounds of viral persistence is useful. Adopting one rule for everything in the same way a 14-day human quarantine is used to decide that a person without symptoms is not, not affected is the way to go. We therefore, as we know, we adopt 14 days, even though we know the coronavirus can potentially appear after that time. With transmission persistence on surfaces in museums and galleries, an isolation period of at least seven days seems to be uh, where we've landed at the moment. The period suggested is based on all laboratory research data conducted at room temperature that's available to date across all materials tested to date. Bear in mind, this is still a work in progress. We're learning as we go. There's a massive amount of work being done on this, um, but we're learning as we go. With hard surfaces, metal exhi exhibits some differences in persistence among themselves and can overlap with organic porous substrates. So you don't just always get metal 
as a hard surface, it's sometimes embedded in paper or cardboard or cloth. Uh, metal ions, zinc in particular, are part of essential virus protein structures. And in fact, there is evidence that copper and silver interfere with those virus proteins, which is why these two metals are present in some disinfectants, believe it or not. Uh, with soft surfaces, high surface textures like um, textiles, for instance, uh, reduce transfer from the surface to human skin, but it also makes it harder to kill the virus because it can embed and shadow, in, shadow behind uh, parts of that surface. Let's look, if we can, at some typical hard surfaces just to get some idea of how long surface transmission can occur. Metal is interesting because you have, for instance, iron, where we think the virus can last about five days, stainless steel about four days, brass and bronze about three days, but copper, wait for it, only about four hours. And that copper and silver, as we said, uh, seem to be uh, the uh, metal ions in them uh, seem to break down the virus very well. Glass, likewise, it can last about four days, stone and concrete about three days, and plastic, anything from four to seven days. So you can see uh, within all of those, we're not going over seven days with any of that transmission. Let's try soft surfaces. And uh, with textiles, we have about uh, two days, we think, and bear in mind that point I'm making that the virus can hide in the texture of textiles. Then we move into a number of unclear areas. We don't know how long it lasts on gilding. We indeed don't really know how long it lasts on either painted canvas or on wall paint. We do know it lasts about three days on wallpaper. Uh, we know on paper that it lasts probably only three hours, but on cardboard and books, it can last up to two days. And with wood, we know it lasts about two days. So I think that gives us some idea of how long we're dealing with transmission persistence in both hard surfaces and soft surfaces. But let's look at a few other things that impact on that. In particular, two environmental factors, temperature and relative humidity. Now, although environmental factor research is still limited, studies of other similar coronaviruses ind indicate that environmental conditions such as temperature, relative humidity, and the presence of ultraviolet radiation can affect how long viruses persist on a surface. Let's look at temperature. In general, refrigeration prolongs viral persistence. Refrigeration pro prolongs viral persistence. So anything of um, zero up to six or eight degrees, uh, the, the viral will persist longer. Between room temperature, say from about 10 to 15 up to about 35 to 37, we don't see there's much change in persistence beyond what we've already identified on whether you've got these hard or soft surfaces. Once we go over about 37 degrees, uh, it indicates that the viral persistence starts shortening, and once we're over 60 degrees, uh, there is a rapid loss of virulence. With relative humidity, again, there's some important things uh, to re remember. Low relative humidity prolongs viral persistence. So we've got low temperature and now low relative humidity both prolong viral persistence. Moderate uh, RH in the area that um, we always recommend for museums, which is 40 to 60 percent, um, seems to be uh, persistence seems to be as per the uh, scales I've already provided. Once we're over 80 percent humidity, viral persistence seems to drop dramatically off. Now, uh, in tests examining the transfer of bacteria and viruses from materials to skin. Moderate humidity was shown to enhance the transfer, while low humidity reduced the transfer, with smooth surfaces allowing substantially higher transfer than porous surfaces. All this ties in with what we're seeing to date. In summary, therefore, cool temperatures and low RH prolong viral persistence. High temperatures and high RH result in a rapid loss of virulence. Greater caution, what does this mean to us? Greater caution 
is therefore suggested if contamination is occurring in cooler collection spaces, particularly in walk-in freezers or unheated rooms in winter, uh, particularly again when the RH is low. There's a separate issue there. When RH is low, uh, dust tends to be raised more, and this can be problematic since it re-aerosols any attached viruses. So I reiterate, in the context of heritage collections, which comprise a diversity of materials and structures, a simple conservative estimate that reflects the outer bounds of viral persistence is useful. Thus, an isolation period of at least seven days for heritage materials that are suspected to be contaminated with COVID-19 is recommended to protect people's health by minimizing the possibility of transmission via contaminated surfaces. Okay. We've now understood how long it's going to last, how are we going to get rid of it? Let's just come back to that useful diagram, which shows uh, the three component parts of the genetic material, the membrane, and the protein spikes. Let's look at how we're going to get rid of it. And what we've got to do is look at the various methods we can kill it with. First of all, let's look at soap. Soap contains fat-like substances known as amplifiles, some of which are structurally very similar to the lipids in the virus membrane. The soap molecules compete with the lipids in the virus membrane, and this is more or less how soap is removed, uh, removes normal dirt from the skin. So the soap not only loosens the glue between the virus and the skin, but also the Velcro-like interactions that hold the proteins, lipids, and genetic material together. Soap has two components. It has its water-hating tails and its water-loving tops. And those help break the interaction. Let me show you a diagram of that. Uh, they break the interaction around the edge of the membrane and they uh, uh, break down the virus as a result. They disrupt the wheat interactions between lipid molecules in the membrane, tearing it apart. Once the virus is broken up, um, which has safely sheltered the genetic material in the middle, it will no longer be able to do its infectious job. It's like a machine with its parts all falling out. The soap molecules then surround the virus fragments. You see it's gone round the uh, protein spikes. Um, and this cluster is called a micelle, and it, uh, it allows then the, uh, the micelles to be washed down the sink. So soap is an extremely effective way of getting rid of the virus. Let's just come back to our second point, which are sanitizers. Hand sanitizers mostly contain alcohol, generally ethanol, isopropanol, or a combination of other alcohols. All are effective against the lipid wrapped viruses. They're thought to work by preventing the proteins of the microbes, including bacteria and the viruses, from functioning normally. Hand sanitizers with a high alcohol content interfere with the lipid shell surrounding the coronavirus, but they have to soak it to allow it to interfere. To be effective, they must have a certain amount of alcohol, at least 60% alcohol. Some researchers recommend more than 75%. We'll look at that in a minute. By comparison, red wine has about 12 to 15% in it and vodka about 46%. So don't try dipping your hands in either of those and expecting to kill off the virus. Bear in mind also a higher alcohol content is not normally more effective. For instance, ethanol, uh, at 70% requires two minutes to be effective. At 80%, it requires only 30 seconds to be effective, but it doesn't get any more effective as you take it up to 95 or 100%. Isopropanol requires about 30 seconds at 70%, uh, but 10 minutes uh, at 50%, uh, and it gets no more effective if you raise it over 30%. You need to have the water in the sanitizer to keep the alcohol from evaporating too fast. Because what this does is it drenches the virus and breaks down the membrane as a result. Now, just come back to my point on soap. Soap is better because you only need a small amount of soapy water with rubbing to cover your entire hands, whereas you do need literally to soak the virus in ethanol for that brief moment, probably at least 30 seconds, uh, to allow it to be effective. So soap, that humble bar of soap, still remains our most effective way of killing the virus. Let's look at a couple of other ways we can kill it off. Disinfectants, these are mostly alcohol-based um, and they 
they typically contain 60 to 80 percent of ethanol and they will kill off the virus in the same way as the sanitizer. UV, ultraviolet radiation. Um, ultraviolet disinfection of the SARS virus demonstrated the loss of virulence after one hour, hour of exposure at 99, start again, at 260 nanometers and more than 90 milliwatts per um, cubic centimeter. But not a good idea for application with heritage material. UV light, as we know, is not only potentially damaging to historic textiles, paper, wooden pigments, it's also a health hazard to skin and eyes. The current display recommendations uh, are zero microwatts per, per uh, cubic centimeter, not milliwatts, microwatts. It used to be only 75. So don't, in this instance, consider UV as a way to kill the virus. Finally, ozone, which you may have heard talked about as well. Ozone can destroy activity of the virus, but it's also an irritant and a health concern, and its cumulative harm on uh, through oxidization of objects in collections suggests, again, it's not recommended for use, use in museums and galleries. So I hope that's been a useful summary of the background to the virus how we can kill it. Now let's move to some more practical issues. Um, I'm just putting that slide in there um, as a uh, placeholder. If you want any more information on this, there are details, they'll be available afterwards to you as well. I'm now gonna move to my friend and colleague, Sarah Jane, to talk about daily cleaning uh, in the time of COVID-19. Sarah Jane. Thank you, Julian, and it's great to be here um, at museums and galleries um, and fantastic to see the range of people out there somewhere all over the countryside. Um, and I guess that's one of the lovely things about this time, which is quite challenging, um, that we don't all have to gather in person. So people in regional areas are able to participate as much as anyone else, which I know for me is fantastic to know. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that there's a lot of information out there that I that I have drawn on in getting myself informed about all of this. And really my, my knowledge is very small compared to some of those out there. I'd particularly like to draw your attention to the Canadian Conservation Institute who've been doing some fantastic work and their webpage, Caring for Heritage Collections During the COVID-19 Pandemic is really essential reading. It has a lot of links in it to webinars and discussions and some of the research that's going on. So I'd really encourage people to have a look at that. Historic England um, have again put together a great document around cleaning and disinfecting historic surfaces. And what's really great about that one is it actually goes down and drills down to look at different sorts of materials and what you should and shouldn't use. It's, it's general enough, but, but it is a very good document. And similarly, um, National Park Service in the USA have put together some great guidance around exhibition cleaning, which is broader than just historic environments. And again, I'd encourage you to look there. Museums and Galleries New South Wales, of course, have some great resources that are much broader than just cleaning and address all sorts of issues around COVID-19. And the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials has a super resource list, um, which links into some of these others. And again, is worth referencing. So here we are in 2020. I'm sure no one is having the year they thought they were going to have. It's a year where we have to be more agile and have more flexible thinking than we'd ever thought before. We've been asked to be more responsive, more adaptable, more inventive, more patient and more imaginative than we ever thought possible. And now I'm sounding like an ABC ad. We've had to adapt to new ways of thinking, working and communicating. Um, and not all of this is bad. I must say from my perspective, I work across 12 sites and the opportunity to meet by Zoom, even if I am at work is fantastic because it avoids me having to drive 40 minutes back into town for a one hour meeting. So there are some upsides. Us being able to do this on Zoom is one of those, but yep, it's a challenge. And we're all still learning. So everything I'm talking about today, please take with a grain of salt and understand I'm trying to figure it out as much as anyone else um, and just take it that way. So where do we begin? 
some of you might remember the beginning of the year, we were all going through bushfires. And we really thought that was going to be the story of 2020. It was pretty tough and it was pretty awful. We use a lot of masks already, P2 masks at work for various reasons, and we were running low. In January, I rang our suppliers and they said, oh, call us back in March. And I should add, when I called them in March, they told me to call in July. So it, it has been quite difficult getting hold of some of the materials and equipment that we take for granted. By February, we were noticing a large number of cruise ships coming into Sydney Harbour. A lot of the cruises that would normally have been up around um, Asia were suddenly being diverted and coming around Australia. And I'm, I'm sure some of the rest of the country was the same, but it was quite overwhelming. We'd have one here docked at, at Circular Quay, a couple more around at White Bay, and often a couple more moored just out in the harbour. And for, muse for Sydney Living Museums, for our staff, this was beginning to be a bit of a concern. We were quite thrilled to have the visitation at the Museum of Sydney and Hyde Park Barracks and all around the place. But we were a bit concerned because we'd already heard about some of the Princess Line issues that were going on. And indeed, we did have people coming off places like, ships like the Ruby Princess, asking our, our staff to look after their, their bags while they went around the museum. So I started sort of thinking, oh gosh, what does this mean for us? Particularly a case, Hyde Park Barracks was just opening and we were doing a lot of cleaning of showcases. And I think the final straw for me was when one of my colleagues said, oh look, be careful of that showcase over there. I saw someone sneeze across it earlier in the day and we sort of started thinking, wow, what does this mean? And at the very same time that, as I said, that equipment we were used to using like methylated spirits was suddenly disappearing off the shelves as much as the toilet paper. So we were racking our brains, asking each other, trying to find out what to do. And I must say, from some perspectives, we were quite relieved when the place closed. Everything closed down, gave us a bit of breathing space. So what did we do next? You know, loans started being delayed, our touring exhibitions, some of them were turning up early because returning to us for storage and it was a difficult time. So we then had to pivot and turn around and look at what was happening if we locked down. So we knew we were closing to the public but we weren't sure if we were going to be forced home and who would be allowed on site. So we did a bit of brainstorming around that and thought about things like well you know at the very same time as all this was going on we'd had in the previous three months, three major storms in Sydney, which had caused a lot of damage. What would happen if we had a major storm whilst we were all locked down? What would happen if the air conditioning got turned off? What, what about if there were break-ins? And heaven forbid, what about if our buildings suddenly were taken over by government to be used as offices or some other purpose? Um, for that reason, we decided to take a lot of the more fragile things off display and put them into storage areas where we could have a bit more control over what was going on. Some of the more robust things we did leave on and we covered a lot of showcases. We started leaving each day as though we wouldn't be able to return. We made sure we emptied rubbish bins every night because we were a bit concerned about, you know, if we weren't able to get back for a few weeks or a month, what would the place smell like? And I should add a colleague, a friend of mine who works in a large office where she's the only person going in for the last few months, ended up having to get her master key and opening everyone's drawers and cabinets to find all the leftover oranges, apples, and goodness knows what that was starting to smell. So we were right, that could have been an issue. As it turned out, we were never completely locked down and those of us who work back of house were able to continue working all the way through. And suddenly it was late May and we were told that we would be reopening in a few weeks. We're now open four days a week at a number of our properties um, and not, none of them are back open at seven. We've, one of the things we've noticed in Sydney in winter is that we've had some mould outbreaks, which are partly due to the fact that we're closed more often in some of our non-air conditioned spaces. So the air's still for longer, it's become more humid and that's just one of those consequences. One of the upsides is that because we're not open as often, we have a bit more flexibility with some of our staff who've been assigned to work with those of us who work on collections. And that's given us more time and more, more staff to do the cleaning 
which helps combat the problems we've had with mould. Initially, we had an increase in pests, particularly rodents, and that we suspect was because there was a lot of food and things left around the city. Um, that seems to have slowed down a bit lately, which is good to see, but we're always on the lookout for those little pesky pests, especially now that we're hitting spring. So we, we started thinking, okay, so before we reopen, how are we going to operate in this new environment? How many people are going to be allowed in the spaces? How are we going to move around the spaces? What are we going to do about those interactives that we've encouraged people to touch and, and use? Can they be adapted or do we need to actually remove them before we open? And as many of you would know, one of the things in Australia is that we have the four square metre rule and that equally works in our historic spaces. So Forkley's house here is a perfect example where some of our, my colleagues went around and had a look at how much of space people would need and decided that it would be a good idea if we actually reduced the amount of furniture in the room so we could accommodate more people standing at a distance. So the ottoman you see in the foreground and some of the chairs and things were moved around to give that space and we took them off site. So looking at a new cleaning regime, we had to think about how people were actually in the space, how often and, and what that meant. At some of our smaller places like Maroogal, we've got booked times that people can be in the space. We're cautious about doing a full tour as one on one, but we sort of have a pulsing of people going through at very specific times. At the Museum of Sydney, people are more able to just move through as they arrive, but we've had a children's exhibition which does have timed bookings. So we've got a few different ways we operate. And then we were looking at some of those high touch areas like doorknobs, banisters, showcases, as we had found at the beginning, we know with our showcases, we see fingerprints, head, head butts, you know, on the screen, on the glass and things like that. So we know that those are actually high touch. Seating, we reduced the amount of seating so that there was less chance of people touching things they shouldn't. And of course, lift buttons are one of the major ones. We only actually have a lift open to the public at the Museum of Sydney, but that's something we've been very aware about. One of the things that um, one of our, my colleagues came up with, which I think was a really good approach, was our exhibition that has all these children's balls and things to play with. Each child was given a paper bag with all the activities they needed for the space, but obviously the balls we couldn't quite do that with. But at the end of each session, the balls were actually taken out and bagged up. And as you can see, I'm sorry it's upside down, but that's just the way they were stored. The date that it was used and the time is on the top. And then after that, there's the date and time it can be reused. So it's taken off for a week, rotated around, and then it can go back on. And this means we don't have to do a lot of touching and a lot of cleaning but we know that the, by that stage, the virus has died. Um, and we've also left a lot of doors open when we open up so that people don't have to open them. They can just walk through the spaces without touching things. And as I said, some other items that might be a problem, we've just removed altogether. One of the things we were particularly worried about was French polished surfaces. This is Marugal. As I said, Marugal is a house which has timed visits. It's only open on Saturdays, but we have five tours, I think, during that time. So people, and in between, our staff wanted to be able to clean the high touch surfaces. The one they were most concerned about was this banister. It's a, it's a narrow space. We have a lot of older visitors and they obviously need to actually use the banister to go up the stairs. So we can't say to them, don't touch. We talked about using sanitar sanitizer at the top and bottom of the banister. Um, and we, talk, we had talked about what we might clean it with. And in the end, we decided that we would actually put a cover over it and protect it in that way. So this is that cover. And I'm just going to actually show you what they look like. If we can just go across to the video. So this is one of the larger size. This comes in two sizes. There's this, this size, which fits on larger things. And this is the one you can actually see on the screen. It's, a, it's one that fits over our banisters. And the reason we went for this is because you can then easily wipe them with the wipe balls or whatever you want to use and not worry about it. And the other thing is for all of you who you know, don't have much time, this is how long it takes to put them on. 
that's it. It's very easy. Um, and they cut with a kitchen knife. They come in a metre long length. They're only about $12 a metre. Um, so it was a really good quick solution for us and we've been very happy about that. Um, this is just showing you what it looks like on the banister. We didn't actually need to have all the cotton tape that's tied on it. I think it would have stayed on its own, but the, my curator thought it looked more decorative that way. And if we go on to, I can get the next slide to go on. Like that. Try that now. Here we go. Um, and we did need the cotton tape there as it curled around the corner. So that's the sort of thing we're starting to do. So in terms of cleaning, whether it's for COVID specific daily cleaning or the sort of cleaning you might be doing during this time period where we need to distance, these are some of the things we've thought about and some of the approaches we're now using. Um, we try to limit shared equipment where possible. So with the large project that we're doing at the moment, um, we have got a little box for each person, a little plastic box that I just bought at Bunnings. You could use a bag or anything, but it just means that you can identify each person gets a box and all their personal protective equipment can go into that box and you can label it, which means that it, it's avoiding all that cross contamination. With a lot of stuff like brushes and things, you might not be able to um, have them assigned to a specific person. You want it, what we're trying to do is have a bucket or a tub that all the used equipment goes into and then at the end of the day, you can wipe it all down with sanitizer. Um, and don't forget to wipe down your larger equipment like vacuum cleaners and ladders and tables and things like that. We mostly use a methylated spirit solution in a bottle, which we're able to spray onto cloths and clean down. Um, remember that nitrile gloves and masks can also help reduce cross-contamination um, between people, that is. And, and, you know, they are also useful when you're doing things like opening and closing so that if one person is open for the day and another person is going to close, if you've got gloves on when you do that procedure, which might involve opening doors and windows and all sorts of things, if you've had the gloves on, then, then you know that no one's actually physically touched that surface. We also use aprons quite a lot. Um, you can use them, wash them at the end of the day, either get people to take them home and wash them themselves, or if you have a washing machine that's available for everyone, you can do that at the end of the day. This is um, a photo of some of my workmates. We've been doing a big project out at Rouse Hill, one of our properties over the winter. And as you can see here, each person is given their own table to work at. These are, again, just tables from Bunnings. They're plastic tables. We spray them down at the end of the day with the methylated spirit solution. Um, and as you can see, we've got masks, gloves, um, and also because we're working outside, we've got some marquees. As I mentioned, nitrile gloves are very useful. We use them a lot anyway in conservation. Um, they have been getting a little bit harder to get a hold of, so you might have to be a bit inventive there. As I mentioned before, P2 masks had been getting more difficult. There are some available now, again, at, at Bunnings and things like that. They're not the ones I prefer to use, which have a carbon filter in them as well, but for everyday use, they're fine. One of my favourite tools is this manual compression spray bottle you can see here. These again you can just get from Bunnings. I'd actually suggest you get a one litre rather than a two litre because um, when you're making up solutions, particularly methylated spirits, you it will start to evaporate so the solution won't stay in the right quantity for too long. By using these pump bottles, you can put it under a bit of pressure, which means it's contained and it doesn't evaporate as fast as well. The little knob at the top you see, you pump down, that pressurises the bottle, and then you spray it out the nozzle at the front, which gives a fine mist, which is more controlled for the sort of cleaning we use. Um, you can use microfiber cloths, which we use a lot, and what, again, bag and wash them up at the end of the day. As Julian was saying, warm water and detergent is the best way of killing coronavirus. So washing regularly your cloths, not reusing them all the time is really important. Reuse them, but wash them before you reuse them. Um, we, there's been a discussion around, well, should you be using cloths now or just you know, wiping things down and throwing them out? That, that's also an option. Um, if you are doing that, just 
think a little bit about what sort of towel you're using. There, um, the blue one called rag on a roll is a lot more effective for cleaning than the towels that you use in the toilet and the bathroom and it won't leave as much um, deposit behind. Wipol is another brand or you could use Chucks from the supermarket and I actually found in the supermarket the other day, I'm just showing this, I, I won't, don't, don't worry about showing this up. Um, it's, oh, actually, yeah, just put me up for a moment. Um, I tend to go to the supermarket in Bunnings a lot to see what's available. This is something that I found the other day. It's um, called Viva. I don't know, is that the right way? Yep. Yeah. And these are paper towels that are reusable or they, they act in the same way as the rag on a roll. And you can see it's, it's quite strong. I've tested it out at home um, and they, they do work quite well. So I saw those at the supermarket the other day and that could be quite a useful thing as well. We'll go back again. So um, detergent in water is also really great, but what detergent to use? And we'll talk about that again in a moment because I've had a bit of trouble finding exactly what I want. Um, our general approach to cleaning is to think about the number of people that can work in a COVID safe manner in the room you're working in. You've probably already gone through that process of figuring out how many people can fit in each room. Um, and sometimes you might need to do activities where you have two people in a room where you can't fully socially distance or you need to move things. In those circumstances, make sure you're wearing masks and gloves um, and, and limit the amount of time you're doing that and plan it in advance. And um, again, make sure when you're using spray cleaning agents that you do it onto the cloth, not onto the surface that you're cleaning. And that helps reduce the risk of liquids ending up in a place that you don't want them. And I'll just go back to the, if I can go to the video again, I just wanted to show you how I fold my cloth. This is a bit daggy, but you know, it's useful to know. When you've got a cloth, what you wanna do is rather than just have the whole cloth and crunch it up like that, where you don't know where you've been, it's really good to be able to fold your cloth up like this, fold it once that way. And if it's like this, fold it that way. And then again, like that. That way you've got this much surface that's clean. You can then turn it around and use that surface. Then you can open it up and fold it the other way and use that surface and that surface, and then open it all the way like this, turn it round. And that way you get a lot of surfaces that you can use either that size or whatever without getting confused. And you will know where you've been up to because you only wet with your spray the amount that you, the, the surface you're using at the time. If we go back to the um, screen, other screen again. Oh, sorry. Um, as I was saying, methylated spirit 70% in water is what I use where I can. Um, this is something we use for mold cleaning as well, but obviously not everything will work with that. Surfaces like glass, showcases, metal door handles that don't have a coating on them um, and stonework are fine to use. It's fine to use the methylated spirits. But for other things, you want detergent in water. That might be Perspex showcases, although of course you can use Kunststoff for that, which has a detergent agent in it. Um, plastics, painted surfaces, please make sure you check that it hasn't broken down first because we've seen some issues with um, varnish layers which have broken down a little bit. And if you use water on those, it can get under the varnish layer and cause issues. Um, would, without a surface finish is fine to use with the detergent. I've been trying to figure out what is the best detergent to use um, because you, you want to use one that doesn't have um, dyes in it, doesn't have perfumes in it, and is as simple as possible. Orvis paste is something that's used in conservation quite a bit. Um, and you can get it in, in Australia from um, archival survival, but also from some of the suppliers for um, textile art and um, quilting and things like that. Interestingly, I didn't know this until I started trying to track it down. Orvis paste is used a lot in, um, for show horses, for, for cleaning horses and other um, large animals for show. So if you live in the country where there might be more vets working with large animals, you might want to ask them if they have access to something like Orvis Paste. Anyway, you can order it online. Um, and if you Google Orvis Paste, it is available in Australia. So just get on to the next slide. 
apologies. Yeah. Um, just a reminder that heritage surfaces might be less robust than you think. And you do need to, particularly if you're using a detergent, you need to rinse it off with um, water afterwards. Don't, I don't mean spraying it with water, I mean using a cloth that's damp that you can wash it off. Please make sure if you are doing any cleaning that you test an area that you're planning to use in a small discrete spot. Don't go over the whole surface and then realise you've wiped off your beautiful varnish layer. I always like to take photos before, during and after I've done that test so that I can just reference it and give yourself enough time to make sure that the area is completely dry and that you've looked at it before you go on to anything else. Because sometimes things can look okay when they're a little bit damp and then you let them dry out altogether and you discover something really awful. Um, if you have any doubts at all, please contact a conservator, someone like Julian or you know, call the staff at museums and galleries. You're better to spend some time thinking through what you're going to do than rushing into it and then having to try and rectify the situation. So take your time, think it through, talk to others, look at all that information that's online um, on those reference pages I've given. And if you've got any doubt whatsoever, contact a conservator. And thank you very much. I'll now pass back to Julian. Thank you very much, Sarah Jane. And that's a wonderful uh, uh, summary of some really useful information and indeed the story of Sydney Living Museums and their response to it. What I now want to cover is um, uh, deep cleaning um, and talk relatively briefly about uh, that component of the COVID-19 response. If there's good reason to suspect that an infected person may have touched a historic surface or that an area may be contaminated, it will need to be protected, quarantined and disinfected, what's known as a deep clean. Now, in preparation for a deep clean being required, and I do suggest you all do prepare for such, approach planning for it by applying a standard risk ass assessment process, i.e. in cascading order, remove the risk. If you can't remove it, mitigate it. And if you can't mitigate it, then plan how to manage it. So. Let's first of all look at avoiding the risk all round in the first place. And some of this overlaps with what Sarah Jane's been saying, but it's issues like can access to the room with the historic surfaces that the virus could lie on be restricted? Can barriers be put in place to keep them away from historic features? Can a no touching policy be put in place? Can the historic surfaces be covered? Because uh, it's, if, if it's impossible to allow them to be uh, stop being touched, then issues such as covering banisters in the way that Sarah Jane was talking about makes a lot of sense. It may make sense to cover things with Tyvek or indeed with Perspex on top of flat surfaces to stop the process of them being touched and the virus transferring from that point of view. So. Let's then look at the next issue of mitigating the risk if we've done all we can to avoid the risk in the first place. If we do end up having a deep clean required, can the rooms or areas or surfaces be quarantined? As we've discussed, using time to let the virus naturally deactivate on historic surfaces is the safest, cheapest, and most environmentally friendly method of disinfection. And if you can close the space for seven days, you then can uh, revert to a standard conservation clean after that. You don't have to undertake a deep clean itself. However, let's say that you do, it's impossible in your place, uh, your gallery, your museum, your historic house to close it for seven days. How then are we going to manage a deep clean safely? Before the disinfection takes place, it's very important to consider the following. First of all, understand the historic surfaces you've got. What is the substrate material? Has it got an applied surface finish? Has it got paint or varnish or gilding or wax on it? What's its condition? Is it fragile, flaking, cracking, or in poor condition? Because uh, a liquid chemical disinfectant may cause further damage 
uh, in all these instances. Secondly, understand what the disinfectant that is going to be used is proposed. Look at uh, the material safety data sheets to understand what it's about and understand uh, the, the difficulties, the, the dangers around that in terms of the surfaces it's potentially going to be applied on. Don't in any form use disinfectants that include things like chlorine or other um, water purification treatments that uh, are likely to affect uh, historic surfaces. Don't use detergents or disinfectants that include quaternary ammonium compounds, I'll come to this in a moment, QACs. Um, many commercial biocidal products do, do include as their disinfectant agent, the QACs. They can be difficult to identify when you're looking at uh, material safety data sheets, uh, but they can be strongly acidic or alkaline and can damage historic surfaces. Uh, so although we don't know a great deal about how they do this, uh, much more important to avoid them uh, in the first place. And finally, don't use heat or steam devices that may be suggested as a way of disinfecting. Uh, we know that the virus can be killed by very high temperatures, uh, but we also know that the damage likely to occur to historic surfaces are not worth the risk. So let's have a look then at how we actually manage the deep clean. First of all, uh, understand from the cleaner uh, what is being proposed. The case study we looked at for a, a major collecting institution uh, said this is what they propose to do. First of all, close the facility for up to six hours for all staff. Secondly, with a fogging machine to spray disinfectant on the affected spaces, they wanted to use a disinfectant called Biosan 112. Thirdly, once the chemical had settled, which was after 50 minutes, they thought wipe down all the affected surfaces with, with um, a sanitizer disinfectant, which had 70% isopropanol in it, and falsely ensure all the staff were wearing full PPE. We responded as follows. First of all, avoid fogging. Electrostatic spray technology, which is what fogging is, is one method of applying a disinfectant. The technique is being adopted as a more efficient application method over complex surfaces. But these technologies are not re recommended for responding to this virus due to questions of efficacy and indeed its potentially adverse health effects. The method of fogging also permits less control over the disinfectant that's applied than when it's manually applied. Since heritage objects and surfaces could be sprayed inadvertently through fogging, the use of this application in collection spaces is not recommended. Secondly, avoid biosan. A biosan is a QAC, it's a quaternary ammonium compound, and for the reasons we've identified, uh, this doesn't make sense uh, and is dangerous potentially around heritage material. Thirdly, vacate the premises for seven days and then proceed to clean with standard conservation cleaning processes seem to be a way that we could achieve all of this without uh, needing to go around uh, spraying uh, a, a high alcohol content on historic material. So um, if none of this works and you do have to uh, come in there with the cleaning uh, in less than seven days, these are the things to bear in mind. First of all, cover everything you can, particularly your sensitive surfaces like paintings and gilded frames and historic furniture, because the alcohol in these disinfectants will directly affect them. Secondly, of course, fully PPE, uh, both you if you're in there and your contractors. Thirdly, carry out a trial in a discrete area of what's being proposed. Uh, and if damage is noted in any way, standard conservation practice don't proceed. Fourthly, apply disinfecting chemicals in a controlled way. And Sarah Jane's talked to you about how to do that and some of the materials that make sense to do that. And in applying those, obviously uh, avoid any form of disinfectant, any alcohol-based things on uh, historic surfaces. And when you're working on non-historic surfaces, just be really careful uh, of adjacent historic surfaces that may get affected. Finally, dispose of all those cleaning materials straight afterwards. And uh, the most important thing, if in doubt, uh, consult a conservator before you do any of those things. So 
those really are the ways we recommend uh, that you respond to the need for a deep clean. Try and cut out any need for there being a chance of a call for a deep clean. If you do have to do it, then see whether you can close the place down for seven days and then revert to the standard conservation cleaning that Sarah James talked about. And if none of those are possible, then do it very carefully and in, in limited areas, working carefully through your most vulnerable materials and the methodologies being used. So I hope this has been useful. Do, by the way, fire in your Q&As. Uh, we're ready and waiting to respond to those. Um, what we would reiterate is that this is a work in progress. We've tried to collate together everything that's out there at the moment, and Sarah Jane's given you some really useful reference points. Those are being updated um, every two or three months as more is understood. The business of research is exacting, and of course it's hazardous because you're dealing with this virus that can kill you. And it requires highly trained people and careful experimental design. But given the state of knowledge on the coronavirus st stability, the accepted recommendation from the conservation community is therefore waiting is the most useful and practical response to a contamination event. The isolation of contaminated collections for at least seven days at room temperature greatly lowers the virus risk. But bear in mind, just of after the 14 day quarantine for people, continue to handle objects afterwards with precautions for virus hazards until after the community transmission risk is lifted by the authorities. So thank you uh, to Museums and Garage in New South Wales. Thank you to Sarah Jane, my, my friend, colleague, and co-presenter. And uh, to please now fire in any questions, and we'd be very happy to respond to those. And indeed, I'll just get those up here, and we can uh, respond to them. And the first one that's come through is, where can you buy the foam to cover stair banister? I'm going to ask uh, Sarah Jane to respond to that. I'm going to reverse out. Am I, am I, are we on? Is the screen now? Yeah. 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 Um, yes, sorry, I realised I hadn't mentioned that. And it's a, a company called Protector Foam or Protector, Protector Products, P-R-O-T-E-C-T-A. And what we'll do is I'll make sure that that's provided to museums and galleries afterwards. They're based here in Sydney and um, you can call them and they have, if you go onto their website, you'll see all their products. So if you just type P-R-O-T-C, Protector, P-R-O-T-C-T-A into Google, you should be able to find them, but I'd be very happy to point you in their direction. You probably could use the pool noodles that you find in, um, Kmart or somewhere like that. Um, I'm not sure what those are made of, and I know these are polyethylene, so that's why I use them. Thanks, Sarah. Jane. The second question is, what are examples of items that you would recommend taking off display? I'll let you answer that. <laughs> I think the thing to bear in mind particularly is that, as we've looked, sanitizers, disinfectants have high levels of alcohol, 70% or more to be effective. Alcohol and historic surfaces, particularly uh, on furniture, polished shellac surfaces, and on paintings and on gilding, they don't like each other. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the two should never be brought close together. So if there's any danger of that, the things to take off display are paintings, gilded surfaces, and furniture. Would you like to ask, answer, add any more to that? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure if the person, I now realise they might have been meaning when you're getting ready to reopen, what do you take off display? And the sorts of things we took off were large pieces of furniture to give more room. Um, so we were asked to have a limited number of chairs, so we took quite a few of the chairs that we have in our historic houses off. And even at the Museum of Sydney, we limited seating. Um, and we took out some of our um, touch displays, um, sort of PowerPoints or things that are on iPads. Um, but with some of them, we were able to set them so that they just play themselves. And we have a little note that says, we're really sorry, you can't interact with this at the moment, but you can watch it play through. The other thing we were asked to take off were pamphlets and things like that. But we do have them behind the counter so that they're not being touched. And if someone wanted a pamphlet, we could give it to them, but they're not sitting out on display. Thank you, Sarah. Jane, the next question is, are there any concerns that the large amounts of hand sanitizer used by staff and visitors will be damaging to objects or surfaces over the long term? 
And I think the short answer is that, yes, there are, and Sarah Jane has talked about the particular instances of how you can protect against that. The thing that we would really emphasize is the soap is much more effective and much less damaging for staff and visitors to use. So where possible, sanitizer is a fallback position for obvious reasons. You can't have a basin and soap uh, in your lobby and things, but uh, use soap wherever you can. I'm going to move to the next question is, what is the recommended percentage of all this paste to deionize uh, water? Sarah Jane. Um, it, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it is, I'll, I'll put that up. I'll provide that to people. Um, if you Google it, it, it is available, but I'll make sure I give that to museums and galleries um, so that it's on the website, along with where to get the protective foam pieces. Thank you. So I'll ask you to do the next one as well, which is, when opening up the museum to the public, how often would you clean the perspex or glass display screens? Ah, so that's a really good question. Um, and that really depends on the way you're opening. So as I said, we, we open in a couple of different ways. So at Marugal, not that it's the perspex glass screens, but at Marugal where we are having people come through in timed slots in a sort of a pulsing way, our staff there are cleaning the high touch things at the end of each of those periods um, but in places where you've got people just coming in and out all the time I would suggest probably it's probably good to do that once an hour if you've got the, the people who can do that um, particularly those perspex screens and if you've got buttons for lids those would be the two things that I would be really focusing on there and just doing that kind of walk through all the time to see if you can see marks where people have been touching either glass doors or perspex um, displays or screens. Fantastic. Sarah Jane, I think we need to wrap this up. Thank you for sending your questions, folks. Thanks also for lots of very encouraging comments that have come through as well yep. from as far as field as Columbia. Hello to you in Columbia. <laughs> Glad you've been enjoying this material. Uh, there's access to all of this again through the Museums and Galleries uh, website. Uh, and as I said, we hope it's been a useful collation. So. We'll be signing off. Farewell from us both and take care, keep safe and look after your collections. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.